Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 17 of the Gateway Project. And right here, you can see that I have installed new radiators on the station. Uh, what I did was I modified the uh, saved game file so that the model file being used by these radiators is now coming from the near future pack instead of the interstellar pack but i also modded it so that it will still function with interstellar because it's still doing the same heat rejection that it did i wanted to swap these out because this is what they really look like on the real iss and they just look a lot better this way in my opinion also they don't rotate all by themselves which means now i can use my docking washer from the infernal robotics mod in order to make those panels move when I want them to and so they look exactly like the real thing now and that's really exciting to me I want to keep this uh, as accurate as possible I also had to mod these to be uh, 2.6 times longer than normal you can see when they, what they look like when they deploy here so that's pretty cool it's like the real thing as well and they get out there they're about 13 meters long inside my version which when you scale that 60% will get them to the right size relative to the ISS and I can rotate these on these panels which I had last time but it didn't really show off very well because of the uh, automatic rotation of the ones from Interstellar. So to get those pointed the right way I can just look at the sun and rotate them until they are uh, hitting it on sort of sideways because that's what you really need to do in order to make sure that the sun isn't adding extra heat to the panels. Now when you're using the interstellar mods radiators, one thing you want to keep in mind is your heat waste heat needs to go up a certain amount before they'll actually function. That's the way the radiators work. They have to get up to a certain higher temperature before the heat starts to radiate. So what you'll see is your heat will start rising up and it'll get to a certain point and then level out. Uh, I've actually tried this out. It does work that way, so there's no bugs in it. So if you're using it and you see your heat going up and you're thinking, oh, what's happening? I thought I don't, I must need more radiators. It's still going up. Well, it needs to get to a certain point before it's going to function. So just bear with it. In the last episode, we left off with Bob needing to go and put some lights on that new P1 truss. We docked it into place and I completely forgot to put lights on it before I launched it. So uh, since we're sending up a progress craft with some lights in it anyway, I figured it was a good opportunity to send up some new life support. Just change out the supplies every now and then. The Kerbals get a little cranky when they haven't had enough Kit Kats. We have eight lights in this crate and I'm going to put three on the top in the front and three on the bottom in the front. Uh, actually, it turned out that I had put lights on the backside and I was going to bring up some lights and put them there. But when I saw that I had them, I just took the extra two lights back and we'll deorbit them later. Also, I hadn't cleaned up the P1 truss. If you remember, when I sent up the S1, I had put some RCS engines, some little jets, single direction jets on different points using the uh, RCS build aid to make sure that I was pointing it all in the right direction and minimizing any kind of rotation on the craft as I was trying to dock it. And I need to get those off because once we're docked to the station, we don't need those anymore. Those are just for the getting it docked in the first place. So I figured I would take all the lights out of the box and bring the box back and put it away before I actually installed the lights because it can be a little bit of a pain in the ass trying to carry around the box and put out the lights at the same time. So by taking out all the lights, uh, then we don't have to worry about that. And we can just shift the lights around on the surface afterward. So I'm not sure if you noticed it as I was flying by in the front of the station, those Kerbal Attachment struts are at it again. They uh, look like they're not connected, but when I check them, they are connected. So I don't know why they want to go and come And here. Now they're back again. They just, they disappear, they reappear. I'm thinking about trying to edit the save game file to actually remove those struts and replace them with normal struts that won't have that issue. Another thing I'm considering doing is boosting the orbit of the station itself. 
We're currently sitting at 150 kilometers, and that means that the highest warp speed I can attain is 100 times normal, because anything in the 120 kilometers to 240 kilometer range can only go 100x. If I want to be able to go faster than that, and I have found occasions recently where I have wanted to go faster than that because the inclined orbit of the station makes it difficult sometimes to get into the light. When it goes around to the back side of the planet, I want to speed it up and bring it back around to the front side so that I have light in order to work because I'm doing so many EVAs. But to do that, I think I need to be above 240 kilometers so that I can get that 1000x speed that you can get when you're in warp speed uh, around Kerbin. While I'm looking at this beautiful shot of the space station with the sun in the background, I'm noticing that the progress craft still has its injection stage on the bottom of it. Whoops! I completely forgot about that. Uh, I guess it's been a while since I launched a progress craft, and what I'm supposed to do is decouple that lower stage, but apparently I had so much fuel in it I just kept on going all the way up. Bob is back to work moving those lights around after having clustered them all in one spot. He's able to get them put into place, lighting the station and providing that wonderful dark side illumination that allows it all to look so good. And then we can decouple and go deorbit the progress craft because we have no more use for it. In fact, we have a whole bunch of parts on it that we don't really want clogging up the station with its frame rate killing parts. And another beautiful shot as the progress craft is coming back here and flying in. I'm going to turn this off just so I can get a look at this really gorgeous scene of the sun on the backside of Kerbin lighting the atmosphere as the progress is coming in for its deorbit and destruction. Okay, so the data has been coming in from Minmus and it looks like the anomaly is not generating any dangerous radiation at all. So we are going to send a crew to go take a look at what's going do on down on the surface of Minmus. We have the station ready. It's waiting to be habited. And despite the rainy day, Jebediah is forcing the launch to go on anyway. He is ready to go. He wants to be at Minmus. He wants to be investigating anomalies. He wants to do exciting things. And in five, four, three, two, one, blast off, and we have liftoff of Jebediah's completely unnamed spacecraft other than I know it's called a Hydra crew carrier. As it rises above the clouds, the rain is now gone, proving that Jebediah once again was right, that the rain would have no effect on the launch whatsoever. And so now we will do the most fun thing there is to do in all of my crafts, which is probably this multi-staging sequence of a Hydra crew carrier where all the little shrouds come off and the solar panels come out and the craft heads on its way to wherever it is it's going. In this particular case, it is heading straight from the surface right toward Minmus. And once again, I can do that because if you can see Minmus on the horizon when you launch, you don't even need a maneuver node. Just fly straight toward the horizon and it will push your orbit right over there. You might need to make an inclination change, but you can push your orbit right over there and get an intercept. You don't need any maneuvers at all. So far, so good. We're flying away from Kerbin and heading out away toward Minmus, while the Kerbals on board, Jebediah and his pals, are going to break out some Kit Kats and start snacking while they play a kid's game called Kill the Kraken. Uh-oh, food, water, and oxygen are running out. But fear not, we have planned ahead for this. We know how long it takes to get here, so we've packed some extra food, water, in fact, more than enough food, water, and oxygen in the back of the craft. So we'll just hop back here and pull those out, stick them to the side of the craft, and that will allow us to extract that because 
you can't actually get at it when it's inside the crate still. Now I had to reload because I couldn't figure out why it wasn't coming off my back and after reloading it still wasn't coming off my back. But I have had this happen before with other things and so I know that all I need to do is pick up some other object and that will cause the one that's on my back to pop off automatically. So we just do that and that gets all the parts and then we can hop back inside now we have lots and lots of snacks. Well, you might be thinking, oh, every flight has its glitch and that was ours. That's a phrase I might have heard before, actually. But unfortunately, that is not the only glitch. I accidentally fast forwarded right past my node and Minmus. I, I had my alarm clock, uh, or did I? I don't remember whether I had an alarm or not. Somehow I managed to skip right through and this is actually going to come back and bite me in the butt because we are about to run out of fuel. Uh, I do everything I can to try to get us in here, but on top of having skipped past our node and using extra fuel in order to get back, it also so happens that I am going the wrong way. And look, you can see right here, the station's going one way and we're going the other. So not only do we need to flip around, we still have to rendezvous. So effectively, we have double the requirement. And so the only thing that Jebediah can think of while thinking fast is we should get rid of as much cargo as we can. We need to lower the mass of the craft. He even considered throwing the other two Kerbals out, but uh, it was two against one and they outvoted him. So he goes in and he grabs everything he can, the crates, the container bays. He even takes one thing of monopropellant and then it occurs to him, well, we might want not want to get rid of all the monopropellant because we might end up needing some of that in order to actually finish getting to the station. And it's a good thing that he kept all of that because that's exactly what happens. We begin our burn here to completely reverse our orbit and go the other direction, which is going to take a couple hundred Delta V all by itself. Meanwhile, the station is flying right by. So instead of being able to rendezvous, we have run out of fuel and now need to just worry about whether or not we're going to crash. We are suborbital right now. And if this monopropellant doesn't have enough Delta V to push us up higher before we come down, this is going to be the end of Jebediah. Here we were worried that we might not be able to go to Minmus because of radiation from an anomaly, and instead we're about to crash because we've run out of fuel? Ah. Oh. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't really the fuel we had to worry about, it was simply the thrust, because we have all kinds of monopropellants still on the craft, and we're pushing our way up right now in order to actually make a rendezvous finally. It had nothing to do at all with whether or not we had enough. It was just whether or not we were going to make it before we came down. But apparently there was plenty of time before we completely deorbited because the gravity is so low on Minmus. And so now we can set up our rendezvous here. And then once we rendezvous, we will hop into the station and begin the preparations for heading down to the surface of Minmus, where we will begin investigating the anomaly and trying to delve into its secrets and see what it might hold. If you think you have an idea what might be hiding inside that anomaly, post in the credits. Is it a ship? Is it a new station? Is it a module for the station? Is it some secret device? Is it something else entirely? What could it be? Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that pursuit of space and space exploration in our universe is dangerous, and occasionally lives have been lost. And the events taking place right now in my replication of the ISS coincide with a tragedy in the last episode, I launched the P-1 truss, and in this episode, I need to launch the ESP-2. And that means that in between those two launches, we had the Columbia accident. On February 1st, 2003, the Columbia disintegrated over Texas and Louisiana as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and killed all seven crew members. So to give tribute to those who have lost their lives in the pursuit of space, and not just them, but those who were on Challenger in 1986, or the Soyuz 11 in 71, or the Soyuz 1 in 1967, 
Apollo 1 in 67. And that's not even counting the lives lost in training accidents or on the ground. I will now have a moment of silence before continuing. Despite the tragedies, pursuit of space must continue, and here, it will continue. It will continue with the launch of the ESP-2. This is the external stowage platform number two. Number one went on the side of the Destiny module. Number two here needs to go on the side of the Quest airlock. It had four frams on the top and four frams on the bottom. And each side had two orbital replacement units, or ORUs, when it was launched. I have mine inside this replica of a Leonardo cargo module. And right here, I have been fortunate enough to launch at the same time that the KSS is going overhead. So this would probably be a good time to show how it was that I managed to make such a quick intercept. And any time I can catch the KSS going overhead at the same time that my orbit is pa its orbit is passing over mission control, I try to do this. So you see, I've launched partway up. And I'm still very suborbital, but I have a couple of minutes before I reach my apoapsis. So I have created a maneuver node that will put my ascending node on the orbit of the KSS. And that allows me to tweak the maneuver node and actually create an intercept where direct from the surface, we are now intercepting the KSS. And all I need to do is make a second burn that matches the orbit of the KSS in order to actually get stay uh, close to it here and not go flying past it at some high rate of speed. From here it's just a normal old docking routine and by that what I mean is I start by killing most but not all of my relative velocity to the target and then I point toward the target partially. Uh, splitting the difference in between where the target is and where the retro vector for the target is. And that slowly closes the gap. And by putting the uh, retro, not retro, by putting the prograde marker on top of the target itself, by pushing it toward that, uh, well, really it's more like dragging it toward it because if you burn on the opposite side of the target, it'll pull that vector, that prograde vector, closer to the target, which is ultimately bringing you closer to the target. Ah, now that the Leonardo is docked up underneath the station, Bob can do what he loves best and go out and extract that integrated cargo carrier. There it is right there, the integrated cargo carrier it normally put in place by a robotic arm because it's so massive, but Bob is up to the task. He will carry it on his back and bring it up to the side of the quest module where he will put it into place by hand. How did I get that, you ask? Well, it is a whole bunch of cubic struts that I put into my welding mod and just welded them all together into one gigantic part. So that is one part. The problem with that is that the node itself that does the attachment is difficult to get pointed in the right direction. But I had tested this a little bit down on the launch pad before I sent it up, and I found that if I put a cubic strut on before I attached it, then it would point in the right direction and I could get it all lined up nice and pretty. With that in place, I can now move my frams up and attach them to the ICC, the Integrated Cargo Carrier. I will be simulating frams, of course, using Kerbal Attachment Container Bays. And I'll be putting, instead of ORUs, I'll be putting Kerbal Attachment Containers themselves in to represent those. There's supposed to be four, but I only brought two that were the right size. I completely forgot about them. So I'm going to get the others in a future launch. Oh, geez. Wow, geez. Okay. Uh, are you okay, Bob? Bob? Oh, he's okay. All right. So in a future episode, we will bring up additional ones. 
I'm not sure exactly when that will be, but I do know that in the next episode, we will probably be taking a look inside the S1P1 trusses, because I haven't done that yet. Uh, need to take a look inside that Leonardo cargo carrier, perhaps boost the station's orbit up to 250 kilometers or more. We need to deorbit a big piece of orbital debris that Bill is telling us we need to get rid of or else he's going to walk off the project again. We need to find out where Joseph's rocket is going and what it might be up to. We need to start looking into examining the anomaly and finally actually launch the P3P4. So until next time, see you later, Kerbinauts.